Salutations respected viewers, I am George from Ireland. You wouldn't think it from the background that I am in the very centre of London in this garden here. No, not a big park, but really the very centre. This is Temple Gardens in London. Um, it's so cool because the Knights Templar um, had their inns here. So cast your mind back to the, to the First Crusade. Um, 1095, Pope Urban preached a crusade at Clermont-Ferrand in France, saying that uh, the Mohammedans were an accursed race and uh, that uh, all of Christendom was enjoined to go and liberate the holy places and what's now Palestine and Israel from uh, the, the Muslims. And there was the temple of King Solomon in Jerusalem to, to, to take that back for Christianity. And so various knights, orders of knights were formed and some of them were the Knights Templar, as in their objective was to take back the temple in Jerusalem, the Wailing Wall of which still exists, or the Western Wall, as some people prefer to call it. So knights from all over England gathered here en route to um, the Levant and so on. But um, the Knights Templar and other orders of knights, they existed here. The Knights Templar, they closed down in 1312 and the Crown took this land. Anyway, there have been um, uh, barristers, that's to say lawyers operating this part of London even before 1312 courts of law around here. We're in the City of London, um, as in it's near St Paul's Cathedral. That's the City of London, the financial district. And until um, 1189, sorry, until 1080, until 1889, London really was officially just this area around St Paul's Cathedral. Everything else was, um, say, various uh, boroughs, towns in the county of Middlesex, north of the Thames, or in the counties of Kent or Surrey, south of Thames. Only 1189 Greater London was created. They took the city of London, they took the city of Westminster just beside it, and they took all of the county of Middlesex, they took a bit of Kent and a bit of Surrey, put it together, called it Greater London. But anyway, um, the barristers, their lawyers, they formed um, some inns of court. There was the inner temple, the middle temple, they still exist. Well, there was the outer temple, no longer exists. There was a Gray's Inn, Lincoln's Inn, there are a few more Tabies Inn. Only four inns of court exist. So every barrister in England and Wales must belong to an inn of court, and all four of them are here in London. Even if you actually practice law in Newcastle or Cardiff, you must belong to one of these four inns in London, even if you never come to London. Uh, so here is <coughs> the splendid garden where the barristers can um, uh, you know, take a stroll at lunchtime and it's right beside the River Thames, you can see me. So this garden of peace and uh, tranquility, so verdant right here in the heart of the city. And here is this statue, the Pancreatis, if I got that right, as in uh, the um, Omnipotent Ones, which is a copy of this uh, 16th century sculpture you'll find in Galleria Uffizi in Florence. Uh, Italy. So there are many um, uh, buildings for chambers there. A chamber is a, an office for barristers. There could be just one barrister in a chamber, so that's very, very rare. There could be 20, 30, 40, something like that. That'd be more typical. So every barrister belongs to a chambers and every chambers belongs to an inn of court. Um, so uh, that's that. They, they, they share the costs of the chambers. I would say they're clerks. We'd call them secretaries, really, in modern parlance but in a, in, a, in a chambers are always called clerks as the head clerk, he or she is the boss, and several clerks below the head clerk, depending on the size of the chambers. The head clerk is quite important, quite well paid. So barristers start off and they're often moaning, but certainly at the beginning of their career, the, uh, the head clerk is paid much more than they are, sometimes, well, even sometimes the ordinary clerks. Uh, so here you can see, not that Halloween not so long ago, some pumpkins out there. Anyway, isn't it splendid? So placid. So a, pay, a place for reflection, a bit of calm before going to face the storm in the court. So occasionally there are flats on the top floor and, and barristers live in there, but more likely judges live in there. And outside every chambers, you'll have a list of all the barristers who are tenants there. Now some of them pay to be a tenant, as in they, they are part of the chambers, and it might just be a door tenant, as in yes, their name is on the sign of the door, but they don't actually come here or practice here. They're practicing elsewhere, the Bar of Singapore or Hong Kong. Bar of Malaysia. It used to be called the, I think, the Bamboo Circuit. Um, barristers qualified in England and Wales who are going to practice over there occasionally, like George Carman, famous, used to do that in the 80s and 90s. Not sure how easy that that, um, that is anymore because obviously though the rights of admission, if you're admitted to the Bar of England and Wales, this has recognised the person the right to practice in those other Commonwealth jurisdictions. I'm not sure that holds true anymore. And the, the reverse is not the case. For example, I went to a case, my God, it was in 1998, there was a sort of an immigration deportation case and um, this barrister stood up to speak, although he wasn't actually wearing the wig and gown. And um, 
the, the judge said, what right do you have to appear before me? Uh, are you a member of the Bar of England and Wales? He said, no, my lord, Nigeria. But well, unfortunately, that's not recognised here. Um, <laughs> the old time it would have been. Now, um, Pandit Nehru was called to the Bar of England and Wales, and he was a member of this in of court, as was Gandhi. Um, and obviously Nehru then went back to India and of course he was able to practice law there. So you see this as a typical 1860s motif. You see the black bricks in a diamond pattern. You see a lot of that at Eton and all around London. Um, anyway, if you believe my dear friend William Shakespeare, you read um, Henry VI part one and um, the Wars of the Roses and uh, s s the Duke of somewhere or other, I don't recall where, comes here and he's asked to, to, to pick sides. Are you gonna join? the uh, Lancastrians or the Yorkists are so gonna pluck a red rose or a white rose. And it's completely fictitious, that scene. But anyway, he picks whichever rose and that indicates his allegiance in the Wars of Roses, 1455 to 85, the red rose for Lancashire, or the Lancastrians, and the white rose of York, the Yorkist side, as in two branches of the English royal house, um, slogging it out, knocking seven bells out of each other for 30 years to decide who was gonna be top dog, who would wear the crown. Anyway, I simplify it very greatly. So look, the left of some of it is a little bit of a wilderness. I like it. I don't want it all manicured and pruned back. They shouldn't pair the bushes all the time. Uh, and you can see it's been built over many, many, many different stages, well into the 20th century, because of course, they suffered considerable bomb damage during the um, Second World War. So what else should I say about this? They've got their own church. Obviously, worship is not compulsory, but um, uh, <coughs> so, only in the early 19th century were Catholics allowed to be called to the bar. Of course, everybody had to be here as a Christian, really. With a few Jews in the Middle Ages, they were booted out in 1290 by the Edict of Expulsion, signed by our sovereign lord, Edward of that name, the first, sorry, I should say the first, since the conquest. What about Edward the Confessor? What about the other Edward in Anglo-Saxon times? Anyway, um, but so only Catholic Christians were allowed to be barristers because only Catholic Christians were allowed to be, full stop, in this realm. And then came the Reformation, and only Anglicans were allowed into it. And then the late 18th century said, okay, we can let Protestants of other denominations do it. And then Catholics in 1850s and let Jews do it and blah, blah, blah. The oath that people had to swear to be a barrister was intended to be repugnant to someone of another faith, another denomination prior to that Sorry, time. Sorry, sir, have you got a key? No. 